Having looked at how we can control the growth of microbes outside of the body, now we're going to take a look at pharmacology and what we can do to control microbial growth and infection inside the body. Of course, our options are a bit more limited because we also have to consider how these medications are going to affect the host. Before we begin, a bit of quick terminology. An antimicrobial agent, as the name suggests, is a compound that's used to limit the growth of microbes, particularly pathogens or things that could become pathogenic. An antibiotic is something that's used to limit the growth of bacteria specifically. A number of antimicrobial agents, antibiotics, and also drugs come from natural sources, as we'll see. And pharmacology is the study of drug action. So how does it work on these microbes and what kind of effect might it have on the body? Consider how lucky you are to be living when and where you do. Through most of human history, death from disease was the norm. And what you're seeing on this graph here is the death rate per 100,000 population per year caused by infectious diseases. And you can see just in the 1900s, there was a dramatic decrease. We had some outbreaks like the influenza pandemic, which we'll talk about. But over this period of time, we had the introduction of many vaccines, many important pharmaceuticals, and also just better methods of sanitation. Public health departments were established around the turn of the last century. And before that, people were dumping their sewage and their garbage on the street. It was kind of a free for all. Chlorination of water. This greatly improved the quality of the water that we were drinking. We have penicillin being developed. We have vaccines like the polio vaccine being developed, etc., which greatly lowered this death rate. Consider the enormous impact that sanitation has had on human history and human society. In this photograph, you're seeing New York City in 1905, which in the grand scheme of things really wasn't that long ago. This is before public sanitation, before automobiles were common. Things were done with horses. People got around and moved things using horses. And if your horse died, chances are you'd just abandon it in the street for someone else to deal with. Here you're seeing children playing in a gutter that probably contains feces right next to a dead horse. Going back a little bit further, the invention of the toilet, in my opinion, was perhaps one of the greatest inventions that we humans have produced. Imagine life without the toilet. Although not a household name, like Louis Pasteur, Paul Ehrlich was a very important microbiologist. He invented a number of stains and techniques that we still use in the lab, and he promoted the idea of a magic bullet a chemical compound that can kill a pathogen without also harming the host. And that's tricky to do. I mean, if our goal is just to kill the microbe, there's lots of ways we could do that that would also kill the host. But of course, we want to avoid that. We want to do as little harm to the host as possible. In 1908, he also co-discovered a compound that became known as salvarsin. And salvarsin was the first antibacterial drug. It went through a number of trials and tests and so on, and it was found to be very uh, helpful for killing off bacteria. It was a cure for syphilis, which was a big deal at the time, and syphilis is a very destructive disease. Now, it wasn't the perfect drug, though, because one of the uh, active agents was arsenic, and of course, arsenic harms humans as well. Back in Ehrlich's day, there was a number of chemists and organic chemists that were randomly synthesizing organic molecules in the lab and then systematically testing those compounds for their effectiveness to kill bacteria. So they would test them on these different bacteria. They would test them on lab animals, rats and mice, to see if it had any detrimental effects. And if all that looked good, then they would go ahead and do clinical trials. This is still done today, although we're a bit more careful when it comes to the testing. So that's the process by which salvarsin was produced. It was a compound 
of arsenic that was synthesized in a laboratory and found to be quite effective. The heyday of this sort of synthesize something and test it was the 1930s. And a number of drugs that we still use today come from that period. So back in 1932, a group of compounds known as sulfonamides were generated and tested and found to be very effective against gram-positive bacteria. They interfered with the production of folic acid by these bacteria. These are still in use today, although not nearly as common as they once were because they were displaced by penicillin, which proved to be even more effective. And that brings us to Alexander Fleming, a very well-known, now, Scottish physician. So he was a researcher and doctor, and he was treating people with selvarsin, but also researching to see if there was something better. He worked in a hospital, St. Mary's, and he worked in their department of inoculation. And you can see him here in his lab with lots of petri plates on which he was growing bacteria and testing the effectiveness of different compounds. He was a hard worker, very observant, and he also got kind of lucky. He was working with Staphylococcus, and he was growing this on plates. And of course, the best temperature for growing Staphylococcus is at 37 degrees. So he would put the plates into the incubator, incubate them at 37 degrees, and include different compounds to see if they had an effect on the growth of Staphylococcus. After he was done with his experiments, he would take his plates out and he would leave them on the bench. Now, most people would get rid of their plates at this point. It wasn't so much that he was messy, he liked to hang on to them and go back and look at them later and see if anything had changed. And it's a really good thing he did that. There was another researcher working in the same building that was doing studies with Penicillium notatum. Penicillium is a fungus. Some of the spores that were produced by that lab were floating around in this building. And he found that he had Penicillium growing on some of his plates around the area of growth of the penicillium, there was an area where the bacteria had been destroyed. This was very serendipitous or lucky. The fact that he had left his plates out at room temperature allowed penicillium to grow. Penicillium would not have been able to grow very well at 37 degrees. It would not have been able to compete with Staphylococcus. In the photograph at the bottom here, you can see a plate that has a lawn of Staphylococcus. Remember that lawn refers to a continuous growth of bacteria. The bacteria aren't in discrete colonies, they're touching each other. Also at the bottom of that plate, we have some penicillium growing. And you can see this broad area around the penicillium where there is no Staphylococcus. He noted this, and he proposed that the penicillium was generating some sort of compound that was diffusing through the agar and halting the growth of Staphylococcus and even killing Staphylococcus that was already present. He published his initial observations in 1929 and went on to test the effectiveness of this mold at killing many other species of bacteria. He found that if he took extracts from the culture media that the penicillium was growing in, he could use that to inhibit the growth of many other gram-positive species. But it had no effect on E. coli, typhoid fever, or tuberculosis. He didn't realize this at the time just yet, but as we'll see, this has to do with the structure of the cell wall. He found that this compound, whatever it was, was soluble. It could be extracted from the agar or the liquid media that the penicillium was growing in, and you could pass this through a filter. He found that this compound gradually accumulated with continued mold growth. He took his solutions and he tested them on rabbits and mice to see if there were any ill effects. When he found no pronounced ill effects, he then tried this on humans 
So he tried it on people that had infected eyes. He tried it on the infected surface of an amputated leg, and he had great success. Keep in mind that at this point, he's using these fluids that contain a whole lot of juices and such that have been released from penicillium. He has not extracted the single compound responsible, but he named that mystery substance penicillin. Now don't get this mixed up with the name of the fungi. The fungi is penicillium and the compound is penicillin. Fleming graciously sent samples of his extracts to other researchers, and they were similarly very impressed at the effectiveness of these solutions. Two researchers, Chain and Flory, worked together to isolate and purify the mysterious compound that had these miraculous effects. It was a painstaking process. They would take these extracts from the mold and then expose them to different chemical treatments, chromatography, etc. They would purify different compounds out and test them one by one until they hit on the active ingredient, which we still know today as penicillin. Their work was published in 1940, and that was just in time for World War II. Thousands of soldiers had already died on the battlefield at this point, and many of them died in hospitals from infection. So penicillin was seen as this miracle cure, and they produced vast quantities of it and shipped it off to the front lines. It also proved to be quite effective at fighting STIs, which, as we'll talk about later, a lot of the soldiers also had. Once it was shown how effective penicillin was, researchers started looking for other possible sources of antibiotic. As we've discussed before, fungi and bacteria are in constant competition with each other. Bacteria compete with each other as well. Penicillin is produced by penicillium to ward off bacteria, to eliminate the competition. And researchers found many other compounds made by fungi and made by bacteria that did the same thing. Bacitracin and uh, polymyxin, those are two antibiotics that are produced by bacteria, and you probably have those in ointments in your medicine cabinet. There's some other ones here that you probably recognize as well. Tetracycline, streptomycin, canamycin, uh, erythromycin, etc. Ehrlich and Fleming and others got the ball rolling. Through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, extensive research was done to develop new antibiotics. Some of them were totally synthetic. Some of them were compounds that were isolated from bacteria and fungi. In fact, most of the antibiotics that we use today were developed during this period. And in this lecture, I'm gonna focus on these older antibiotics. There are some really promising, really interesting new antibiotics out there as well, but for the most part, they do work by similar mechanisms. When we're developing drugs to treat an infection, we want drugs that are selectively toxic. And what I mean by that is we want them to be toxic to the pathogen, but not toxic to the host. That's the main thing when we're developing new compounds. There are lots of drugs that are quite effective against bacteria and have been approved for use. And the reason for that is that bacteria cells are very different from our cells. There are lots of targets in a bacterial cell, like the cell wall, for instance, that are not found in human cells. So if you develop a drug that works against that specific target, hopefully it shouldn't have any impact on the host. When we look at uh, protozoa and fungi and multicellular parasites, there's fewer drugs that are selectively toxic and thus can be used. And that's because now we're talking about eukaryotic cells that have similarities to our cells. When it comes to viruses, viruses are intracellular parasites. That means they are living within a cell and reproducing within that cell. That makes them very difficult targets when they're in your body. How are you going to deliver something toxic to the virus without also destroying the cell that it's in and the cells around that cell. So what are the suitable bacterial targets? Well, there's quite a few of them. 
The biggest one is the cell wall, and there's a number of antibiotics that attack enzymes that are needed to build and maintain the wall. Penicillin is one of these. Bacitracin is one of these. Isoniazid is an interesting compound in that it specifically interferes with the production of acid fast cell walls, like we see in tuberculosis. There are several antibiotics that interfere with DNA replication, so the cell can't divide and it may die trying. There are antibiotics that will attack the ribosomes of prokaryotes specifically and prevent them from manufacturing protein. Polymyxins will attack the plasma membrane. We have other antibiotics that attack the cell's metabolism. One of the most common pathways that's targeted is the production of folic acid. Let's take a look at each of these in turn. First of all, we have the cell wall. This is a big target. This is the outer surface of the cell, so it's an easy target to attack. As mentioned, penicillin inhibits the production of the cell wall. Specifically, it inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis. Recall that peptidoglycan is a mixture of carbohydrate and protein, and the production of this substance begins in the cytosol. What you're seeing here, the green surface, is the outer surface of the plasma membrane. And you can see that we have these little building blocks that are being shipped across the membrane, and they consist of two sugars and then a chain of amino acids attached. Those little blue things that are wandering around represent the enzymes that take the amino acid chains and stick them together. They form a peptide bond. Penicillin attacks those enzymes. So if the cell cannot make peptidoglycan, of course it's going to weaken the structure of the cell. The interior of a bacterial cell is generally under pressure. We have water pushing out and the cell wall pushing back. If you weaken the cell wall, if it can't be maintained, then the cell will lyse, it will rupture. In the diagram to the right, you're seeing a complex of proteins that make up these enzymes and they grab onto those subunits as they come across and they put them together. The X's show where penicillin binds and it prevents this enzyme complex from functioning. The original penicillin was extracted from Penicillium notatum. But today we have several different flavors of penicillin available to us. Some of them are derived from other species in the same genus. Penicillin G is an example of this. Others are modified forms of pre-existing penicillin compounds or entirely synthetic forms. Penicillin V, for instance. Note that all of these different forms have different characteristics. So for instance, penicillin V can withstand acid. It can withstand passage through the stomach, and that means that it can be used orally, which is pretty important. Others have a broader spectrum of species that they attack. Now, the reason that we've had to search for different forms of penicillin and make different forms of penicillin is because a lot of bacteria have become resistant to it. A lot of bacteria now produce penicillinase, which, as the name suggests, is an enzyme that breaks down penicillin. So we have to keep on top of this and we have to engage in this warfare with bacteria as we throw antibiotics at them, they throw new defenses at us. And of course, this relates to the overuse and irresponsible use of antibiotics. And we'll come back to that. Another important antibiotic that inhibits the synthesis of cell wall components is isoniazid. But this time, we're not talking about peptidoglycan. This is a drug that inhibits enzymes that manufacture mycolic acid. That mycolic acid layer makes these cells very slippery. So this is a hydrophobic kind of waxy layer within the cell wall that prevents the inflow of other antibiotics. It also means that the cells can't typically be gobbled up by white blood cells. They try, 
they engulf the cells, but they can't break them down. Things like tuberculosis can actually reproduce and survive within a food vacuole inside a white blood cell. So that mycolic acid layer is rather important. If we can inhibit the enzymes that make it, then we're going to have holes in that layer. And then we can also treat the cell with another antibiotic that can penetrate deeper and cause more problems. If you're treating tuberculosis, that's the usual strategy that's used. We have a two pronged approach. We have something that inhibits mycolic acid production, and then we have a secondary antibody that can then get in and do further damage. Membranes are also a very large target. And I'm not just talking about the plasma membrane here, I'm also talking about the outer membrane that makes up part of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. Bacterial membranes are different from ours. It's the same basic construction. We have phospholipids, but remember there's a lot of other lipid types that are inserted and different proteins, etc. Polymyxins are very good at selectively disrupting the membranes of bacteria. Both the outer membranes of gram-negative cells and the plasma membrane. So they can insert themselves into a gram-negative outer membrane and by doing so disrupt the membrane and make little holes in the membrane. So now that membrane is not nearly as selective or semi-permeable as it used to be. The cell has a difficult time sorting out what gets in and what gets out. That could allow other antibiotics to penetrate deeper and attack the peptidoglycan layer. Um, it could allow for additional polymyxin to attack the plasma membrane, and that might allow other antibiotics to get into the actual cytosol of the cell. Polysporin is one of the ointments I was suggesting you might have in your medicine cabinet. It sells very well because it's quite effective, and it's effective because it contains two separate antibiotics. It contains polymyxin B and also bacitracin. Polymyxin B will disrupt the outer membranes of gram-negative bacteria. It essentially punches little holes that allow the bacitracin to also enter. Bacitracin will attack that thin peptidoglycan layer and punch holes in it, which means that polysporin can now get to the cell membrane as well and disrupt it. So we end up with a cell that's very leaky. It can't maintain homeostasis anymore. Neosporin takes things one step further. It has three antibiotics. So we have polymyxin, we have bacitracin again, and we have neomycin. Neomycin will attack ribosomes and inhibit their production of protein. And of course, the only reason that neomycin can get into the cell is because of the polymyxin and the bacitracin. As we've just seen, if we can disrupt membranes and disrupt the cell wall, we can get antibiotics deeper into the cell we can get them into the cytosol. One of the main targets in the cytosol is the ribosome. Neomycin attacks the ribosome, but there are many other compounds that do the same thing. And by doing so, they interfere with translation. As we've talked about in great detail, the ribosome consists of two parts, a small subunit and a large subunit. They're typically floating around in the cytosol as separate entities. They come together and clamp onto a messenger RNA and then decode the information of the messenger RNA. The ribosomes of eukaryotes and prokaryotes are different. They're similar in that they both have a large subunit and a small subunit, but there's a different composition of proteins. The proteins have different sequences. There's a different composition of ribosomal RNA, and that RNA has different sequences. So there are drugs and other compounds that will bind to prokaryotic ribosomes, but won't bind to eukaryotic ribosomes. That makes them a bit of a magic bullet. 
Incidentally, when we're looking at the sizes of these subunits, we generally denote them as an S value. This isn't really that important for this course, but if you're curious on what that means, it's a Svedberg unit named after Dr. Svedberg. Basically, it refers to the rate at which these complexes of proteins and ribosomes will sediment or settle out in a centrifuge. Tetracycline is a well-known antibiotic that's effective against a broad spectrum of bacteria, except for the ones that actually produce this as a defense mechanism. That's where we got this from. It binds to the small subunit of the bacterial ribosome. And what it does is it blocks the binding of transfer RNA. And of course, that's going to shut down protein synthesis. Now it does have some important side effects. One of them that you might be aware of is that if you give this to children less than eight years old, it will interrupt the development of the teeth and it may cause very pronounced discoloration of the teeth that won't go away. So this is something that's not used in children anymore. Streptomycin was originally isolated from the bacterial genus Streptomyces. Incidentally, that's where tetracycline comes from as well. It also binds to the small subunit of the bacterial ribosome. What it does is it blocks the binding of the transfer RNA that carries in methionine. Remember, methionine is going to be the first amino acid of a growing protein. Now, this doesn't totally shut off translation. However, it makes it impossible for the ribosome to correctly read the genetic code. It will grab onto ribosomes and spit out nonsense proteins. There are a number of other antibiotics that disrupt proper translation. So again, some of them are going to block the actual binding of the anticodon to the codon. Some of them are going to prevent the formation of peptide bonds. Some of them will change the shape of the binding sites within the ribosome. Some of them will disrupt the movement of the ribosome along the messenger RNA. But the end result is that we don't get a protein from the messenger RNA, or if we do, it's wrong. The DNA in prokaryotic cells exists in a circular form, as you hopefully remember. The basic process of DNA replication is similar, but it's different enough, and the enzymes are different enough, that the replication of nucleic acids can be a target of antibiotics. Fluoroquinolones contain fluorine, which is an element that's rather unusual in organic molecules. Fluorine is a very reactive atom. It has the highest electronegativity of all the atoms in the periodic table, so it grabs onto other atoms and strips electrons away from them. Fluoroquinolones will attach to and disrupt the activities of bacterial topoisomerase. Topoisomerase is an enzyme that relieves twisting within a DNA molecule as it's being replicated. We've talked about this before. Remember, helicase is going to insert itself between two strands of a molecule of DNA and separate those two strands. Imagine that you had two strings twisted around each other and you grab onto those two strings and you pull on them to separate them. What's going to happen is the string upstream from that fork is going to become very twisted. It's going to become supercoiled. That's the term that we would use. Topoisomerase releases that supercoiling. So as helicase goes along and separates the two strands of DNA so that they can each serve as templates for replication, topoisomerase working upstream will cut one of the strands and relieve that twisting. So if topoisomerase is not working, the DNA becomes hopelessly twisted and it can't be replicated.
And of course, replication of the cell is going to shut down, it's going to abort, and the cell is going to die. Finally, we have the interruption of internal metabolism. And one of the most common targets is the folic acid metabolic pathway. Folic acid is an essential vitamin. It's needed by many of the enzymes that are involved in manufacturing nucleic acids and proteins. Humans get their folic acid from their food. We have transporter proteins and channels within the cell membrane that can take up folic acid and bring it into our cells. We don't make it ourselves. We get folic acid from plants that we eat and they get it from bacteria. Bacteria produce folic acid. They don't take up folic acid from their environment. They don't have the channels and the proteins and so on necessary to do that. Sulfonamides will shut down folic acid production in bacteria. They act as competitive inhibitors. They will bind to the enzymes that produce folic acid and as they're bound, they block the binding of the PABA, which is the precursor of folic acid. So the bacteria are unable to make folic acid. That's going to have a number of detrimental effects on important enzymes that are needed to make DNA and protein. What do we do to test the effectiveness of a new antibiotic? Well, the process is pretty simple. And in fact, you've just done this in the lab. What we do is we grow a lawn of bacteria. We take bacteria, we spread them evenly over a plate. We let that culture soak into the agar. And then we take little disks that are soaked in a known amount of antibiotic and we put those onto the surface. What's going to happen, hopefully, is that after we incubate this for one or two days, we're going to see a zone, referred to as the zone of inhibition, around the disc where nothing is growing. So what's happening is that antibiotic is diffusing away from the disc. It's moving out away from the disc, and as it moves out, of course, the concentration is going to get weaker and weaker. And we're going to get to a point where the antibiotic is weak enough that it can no longer inhibit the growth of the bacteria. The larger the zone of inhibition, the more effective the antibiotic. So you can see the one that I've just highlighted is quite effective. Whereas the zone of inhibition for this one down here is considerably less. We can also use liquid cultures to test the effectiveness of an antibiotic. And that's what you're seeing here. We're looking for the minimal inhibitory concentration. What's the minimum amount of antibiotic that we can use that will inhibit growth? So here what we're doing is we're taking a liquid medium and we're adding in a sample of bacteria. And of course, we're adding the same amount to each tube. We're also adding a different amount of our antibiotic. And you can see that the first four tubes here didn't receive enough antibiotic to inhibit growth. The other tubes, though, are clear, and that's because no bacteria grew. So those first four tubes are turbid which again is a fancy term for cloudy. And we can measure the degree of cloudiness using a spectrophotometer. Antibiotic resistance in bacteria is of great concern. It's something that has exploded over time. And what you're seeing here is just the explosion of resistant forms of N. gonorrhea in the 1980s. Essentially, if you expose bacteria to an antibiotic, you will select four bacteria that are resistant to that antibiotic. Unwittingly, you are evolving antibiotic resistance in the bacteria you're trying to kill. Bacteria grow and divide very, very quickly. E. coli can divide every 20 minutes or so under ideal 
conditions. And because of that, bacteria will evolve very quickly. Imagine that we have a tube that's filled with a few billion bacteria, and we add a little bit of antibiotic to that. Well, the antibiotic might very well kill the vast majority. It might kill 99.9999999% of the bacteria that are present. But maybe there's a few tens of thousands of cells that didn't die. They're resistant. They're resistant just due to variation in the population. Like humans and other organisms, there is a lot of variation. Some of the bacteria will have enzymes that are better able to break down those antibiotics. When we kill off this huge population, what's left are the resistant individuals. And if we allow this culture to continue to grow, we're only left with the resistant individuals. They'll give rise to the next population of cells. This is natural selection. We are unwittingly selecting for microbes, bacteria in this case, that are resistant to our treatment. And they will give rise to a population of resistant cells. And now we have a tube filled of billions of resistant bacteria. There's an incredible little video released by the Harvard Medical School that you should check out. I'm not going to play it here because I'll get a copyright strike and, well, I've learned my lesson already. But anyway, I will leave a link to this video in the description below. Essentially, what they did was they made a giant petri dish, a giant gel, and that's what you're seeing here. At one end of the gel, there was almost no antibiotic added, and then it increases towards the other end. So we have virtually no antibiotic down here, but the concentration of antibiotic increases as we go towards the left. They took some bacteria and they plated them in this zone here and allowed them to grow. And what happened is, of course, the bacteria would grow rapidly and compete with each other. And there were a few individuals that were resistant and they could move a little further into this zone. During that time, some of them would mutate. Those mutations were probably mostly harmful, but some of them might have beneficially affected enzymes that could deal with this antibiotic, and then those mutants could move into the next zone, etc. And we ended up with the natural selection of mutants that could live in very, very high antibiotic concentrations. Basically, they selected for mutants that were antibiotic resistant. Again, though, really, really neat video. It's something I'd kind of like to reproduce myself. Maybe we'll do that one day in the lab, but definitely check it out. How do we prevent the evolution of antibiotic resistance in bacteria? Well, it all comes down to the responsible usage of antibiotics. If you have influenza, you have a virus. You should not be taking antibiotics. It won't have any effect on the virus, but if you have other potentially pathogenic microbes that are living within your body, you may be evolving antibiotic resistance in those microbes. Also, if you are prescribed antibiotics to fight off a bacterial infection, use the whole bottle. Don't stop when you feel better. If you stop when you feel better, you may have killed off most of the bacteria, but the bacteria that are left are likely antibiotic resistant. You have selected for those antibiotic resistant individuals. Keep using it until they are dead as well. Before we leave bacteria, I just want to present another rather interesting usage of bacteriophages to fight bacteria. This is something that's still in its infancy. It was developed, uh, I think, originally by some Russian labs, but they're tweaking bacteriophages so that they will attack 
bacteria that are potentially pathogenic. We can use bacteriophages as weapons. That does raise some potential ethical issues, uh, but unfortunately we don't have enough time to examine those. The weaponization of bacteriophages is a fascinating concept. I invite you to read more about that on your own. Unfortunately, there's so much we can't cover, and I'm really hoping that you're interested enough that you'll go on and investigate some of these things on your own time. Let's move on to antiviral drugs. How do we destroy viruses within the body? It's tricky as I mentioned, because viruses reproduce within host cells, and we want to disrupt their activity without causing too much damage to the host tissue. Also, viruses may be cloaked when they're outside of a cell, enveloped viruses especially. They steal a little chunk of membrane when they leave a host cell, and that makes them look like the other plasma membranes that are exposed to your immune system. Your immune system may have a very hard time identifying them as foreign. Once again, though, we need to apply the magic bullet concept. We need to look for something that's unusual about the virus that we can target. So some viruses have fairly obvious targets. Reverse transcriptase. That's an enzyme that your cells do not manufacture. They never do that. They never take RNA and use it to make DNA. That flies in the face of the central dogma of molecular biology. So if we can come up with a compound that attacks reverse transcriptase, we're golden. That might be a very good magic bullet when it comes to attacking retroviruses. Other viruses do carry their own unique enzymes. They trick the cells into making those enzymes, of course, but they're not enzymes that would otherwise be produced and be active within a healthy cell. Many DNA viruses contain their own DNA polymerase. It's similar to human DNA polymerase, but it's different enough that it can be a target. That viral DNA polymerase is, of course, used to replicate the genome of the virus. Acyclovir is a drug that will inhibit the activities of this viral DNA polymerase. It's an analog of guanosine, and what that means is it's very similar in shape to guanosine. And this viral DNA polymerase will grab onto it and try to add it as a G in a new strand of DNA, but it doesn't work out. And that means that this acyclovir acts as a competitive inhibitor of this enzyme. It's competing with the actual substrate, which is real guanosine. It's very effective against the herpes virus. Acyclovir works against a variety of DNA viruses, but it's perhaps most effective against the herpes viruses. Remdesivir is another drug that inhibits the replication of nucleic acids, but this time we're talking about RNA. You might have heard of this drug before. It was one of the drugs that former President Trump took when he was hospitalized with COVID-19. There were several other drugs as well, but this was part of the cocktail. Now what this does is it inhibits the synthesis of the RNA that would be found in an RNA virus like COVID-19. The drug is an analog of ATP. So again, it has a similar shape to this ribonucleotide. This of course is a nucleotide that's used to build RNA. It will be inserted into a growing chain of RNA nucleotides, but nothing can be added to the end of it. So it terminates that synthesis of RNA. It's also rather effective against Ebola. One of the big drawbacks of this drug is that it has not been produced in mass quantities and it is very expensive. Neuraminidase is a virus-specific enzyme 
that allows enveloped viruses to leave a host cell. It's involved in the budding process. As you might imagine, if we have inhibitors that can shut down this enzyme, that makes it impossible for the virions to leave and infect other cells. Reverse transcriptase is an important target in retroviruses. As we've discussed, this enzyme is only found in the retroviruses, and competitive or non-competitive inhibitors of this enzyme will prevent reverse transcription. They prevent the use of RNA as a template to make DNA, and then there's no DNA to insert into the host genome. HIV and many other viruses generate messenger RNAs that are very long and contain information from more than one gene. So instead of each gene giving rise to one short messenger RNA and being decoded as one protein, this long messenger RNA codes for one very long polypeptide that then needs to be cut up into individual proteins. That cutting is done by viral protease. And again, viral protease is a potential target. There are several drugs that will competitively or non-competitively inhibit viral proteases. In these viruses, very long polypeptides are produced from very long messenger RNAs. Those polypeptides are cut up into shorter proteins by viral protease. Those shorter polypeptides are then going to be folded into active viral proteins that will come together and form these assemblies of proteins that might give rise to the capsid, for instance. Drugs that inhibit viral proteases, either competitively or non-competitively, will stop this process. And we will not get the mature viral proteins that will give rise to a virion. Now let's take a look at how we might limit the growth of fungal cells. Fungi are eukaryotes, just like us. They have a number of similarities that they share with us. However, their membranes contain something known as ergosterol. And ergosterol is similar to cholesterol. It performs a similar function. Remember that in us, cholesterol will interact with the hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails of adjacent phospholipids. They help stabilize the membrane, and they also help keep the membrane fluid at lower temperatures. Ergosterol does the same thing, but we don't have this particular shaped molecule, and we don't have the enzymes that manufacture it. So if we can create a drug that prevents the manufacturing of this particular sterile, then we can disrupt the membrane of fungal cells without disrupting our own membranes. This is exactly what the azoles do. These are compounds that inhibit the production of ergosterol. There's a number of different ointments and creams and so on that you can get that contain these drugs. They prevent the growth of yeast. They prevent the growth of athlete's foot and jock itch. Protists are eukaryotes and protozoans are very similar to animals in many ways. So there aren't that many targets that are specific and safe to attack. There are, however, a number of anti-protozoan drugs, and for many of them, the mechanism by which they function is poorly understood. Quinine is a good example of this. This is a derivative of plant bark, and it's quite effective against plasmodium, which is the protist, the protozoan, that causes malaria. Now, despite what Trump might have told you, it's not effective against COVID-19. And unfortunately, this rumor has made this drug less available to the people that have malaria and actually need it.
it's thought that it interferes with plasmodium's ability to break down hemoglobin. Remember that plasmodium burrows into red blood cells and reproduces inside of them, feeding on hemoglobin. Specifically, it's thought that it interferes with the pH regulation of lysosomes. Lysosomes are little vesicles that contain digestive enzymes. Metronidazole is a compound that's quite effective at killing anaerobic bacteria and also anaerobic protists. Remember the Diplomonidida and Parabolsula? Those are critters that live where the sun don't shine. They live in anaerobic environments within your body, within the intestine, and also within the vagina. So we have Giardia and we have Trichomonas. In these particular cells, this compound is chemically converted into another compound that damages DNA or interferes with the production of DNA. Finally, we have the multicellular parasites, the worms, the helminthes, which are surprisingly easy to get rid of. Yes, they're animals and they're very similar to us, but they live in the digestive tract and our digestive tract is relatively selective. So we can use drugs that will impact them because basically they will soak up everything, but those drugs won't necessarily be taken across the epithelium of the digestive system and into the bloodstream. In all likelihood, they'll be broken down first. Mabendazole is a very effective drug against worm infections, particularly flatworms, um, tapeworms. What it does is it blocks microtubule formation and also inhibits the uptake of glucose. So microtubules are used for all sorts of things, not just for cell division, but also for moving vesicles around, etc. Glucose is a readily available source of energy. There are other drugs that cause paralysis of the intestinal worms. Whether we starve them by limiting their uptake of nutrients or whether we paralyze them directly, the worms will eventually let go. They won't be able to hang on anymore and you have to pass them. Now, passing the worm can be a disturbing experience. If we have a very heavy intestinal infection, for instance, a heavy Ascaris infection, so lots and lots of roundworms, giving this drug might not be the best course of action. That might create a blockage of the intestine. So in cases like that, surgery might be necessary. You might have to go in and physically remove that ball of worms. And as I mentioned before, if you have the stomach for it, so to speak, have a look for some of those videos on YouTube. When determining what drugs should be prescribed to a patient, there's a number of different considerations that need to be made. First of all, is the patient allergic to the drug you're going to prescribe? Do they have coexisting conditions? Will there be drug interactions? Do they have more than one infection? Maybe we can use a drug that has a broad spectrum of impact. And you can see here that there's quite a lot of overlap between these drugs. Some of them will not just kill bacteria, but they'll also kill protozoa. Should we use more than one antibiotic or antimicrobial? Will a two-pronged approach lead us to a faster resolution of the infection? We also have to consider the route of administration. If we're going to give a drug orally, it has to be able to pass through the stomach and still be active. If it's a protein that will unravel under very acidic conditions, well, that's not going to be the best choice. Can we take this drug and inject it directly into the blood? Is that something we should do? We have to consider how to get the drug to the target cells. We have to consider toxicity and allergies, and these are going to be patient specific. We have to consider whether or not the drug will disrupt normal, helpful flora on and in the body. So for instance, 
the vagina is typically a bit acidic. And it's acidic because there are lactic acid bacteria there. The lactic acid bacteria produce lactic acid as a byproduct of their metabolism. If we administer an antibiotic to fight a bacterial infection and also accidentally kill off those lactic acid bacteria, that will disrupt the pH and that may allow yeast and other opportunistic pathogens to get a foothold and cause problems. Also, we do need to consider the cost. Now that's not as big a deal in Canada as it is in a lot of other countries, but if a drug is only marginally better, is it worth the additional cost? Will that benefit the patient? To summarize, killing pathogens within the body is complicated by the fact that we want to cause the least possible distress to the host. The most effective drugs will target molecules or processes that are unique to the pathogen and things that don't happen or aren't present within the host. Some microbes that are easy to kill outside of the body are very difficult to kill inside the body. One of the best examples would be enveloped viruses. COVID-19, for instance, is an enveloped virus. That envelope is a very easy target when it's outside of the body. Soap and water will kill it or destroy it. Remember, viruses aren't technically alive. But inside the human body, it's a difficult target because it is surrounding itself in plasma membrane that was stolen from the host. Here's our terminology list. Now, you should be able to describe the potential targets for each of the groups of infectious agents that we looked at. What are potential targets in bacteria? What are potential targets in enveloped viruses, etc.? You should be able to describe the different drugs that we might use against these different pathogenic agents, and you should be able to describe how those drugs work. What damage do they do, and what are the effects of that? Take a look at the study guide for a bit more information on this, and of course, review this PowerPoint. And finally, here's a few study questions for you to enjoy.